In my mindset, I see a brand new believer sitting across from me as I'm writing my, my study. And I'm figuring out how do I explain this and connect it with something that they get. And welcome back to Teach Through the Word, the podcast for Bible teachers. Chris Langham with you again. And with me again, my good buddy, Peyton Jones. How you doing? Hey, hey. Good to be here. It is again. good to be here. But we still need a theme song. We still need a theme song. We need a theme song. What if we do a new theme song for every book? We're in the book of Colossians. Ooh. What rhymes with Colossians? Nothing. <laughs> nothing does not. No, nothing doesn't rhyme with Colossians. Your dog barking rhymes with Colossians. There that is again. Boy, All right. My dog's barking. <laughs> they are indeed. All right, we'll come up with another theme song later. But right now, we are here to equip you, Bible teachers, to do what you do better. And together with you, to elevate the craft of Bible teaching. Get equipped, get trained. And while you're at it, get a behind-the-scenes look here at Through the Word. And we're getting a behind-the-scenes look on the book of Colossians. This is a favorite. I'm so excited. Peyton, where are we going to go here on day two? So today we're going to talk about the context and we're going to get a little bit analytical as we do on the Tuesday mm. edition. And we are going to look a little bit about the background, the book, genre, author, audience, purpose, and greater Bible context. We may not get through all that, but that's generally what we cover on a Tuesday. We'll get but, some. Uh, yeah. So, you know, as, as you're listening to this, I noticed a market change between how you handled Mark, how you taught through a narrative, hmm. which is something you talked about, versus teaching through a book that is based on precepts, a conceptual book, and in specific, a letter. So I, I noticed your style changed. Uh, you were using more uh, conceptual ideas and hmm. a lot, and I we're, we're going to dig into this more on Thursday, but a lot of pithy, witty statements like like concepts like things that it were that i like to call those tweetable tweets you know mm -hmm. where it was just like boom that would that would tweet you know like just something that really sticks with my brain so talk to us a little bit about how and why you change your style of teaching this book as opposed to a gospel mm, why did i say the antidote to weird christianity so I, I have fun with this. And remember, one of my core philosophies of teaching is to teach in the genre of the text itself. There are a lot of Bible, uh, there are a lot of genres across the Bible books. And I think it is more powerful to, to teach in that genre to, so that you will deliver the message with the same feel of, as the original message. So yeah, back in Mark, I, uh, I was a storyteller. I, it was a narrative and, and it was also a testimony. So I was bearing witness, but Colossians is an epistle. So my teaching should be an epistle. Now I use that word with you, but I'm not going to use it with, uh, with my hearers. It's a personal letter. So I'm going to connect in a personal way. When I teach Colossians, it has to be personal. It has to come from my heart to their heart. And I want to speak to people who I am trying to equip. Now, Colossians is also a, uh, there's also a lot of, uh, of heady stuff. The, the proclamation of who Jesus is comes at a, at a very high level. And Paul is at a very intelligent writer. So in some ways I've got to communicate that. And, uh, and we were talking about that yesterday a little bit when we mentioned the, the concept of, of not dumbing it down, but smartening them up. And for me, this uh, this really comes very naturally because one of my first paid jobs ever was after delivering newspapers was tutoring. And it was the first time I actually applied my uh, my college education, which was rocket science. I was studying mechanical engineering, but I didn't get a job working on rockets first. I get a job teaching algebra one on one with students. And that I'll share more of that when uh, when we do my my interview and talk about my my story. But for me, that really informed at my style of teaching because I was teaching algebra to kids. Now I was studying calculus and differential equations and stuff like that. But as I sat across a table from a kid who was struggling to understand algebra, I really developed my teaching methodology, which was understanding where they're at 
and figuring out what concept that, that I was trying to get across and how it connected with something that they did understand. And so that was really the, the style that I come through that, that probably came through a lot in Colossians. Because in my mindset, I see a brand new believer sitting across from me as I'm writing my, my study. And I'm figuring out how do I explain this and connect it with something that they get. My favorite part of teaching is the light bulb moment. When I grab that concept that for my student goes, oh, I get what this is now. And that's what I'm aiming for with every study as I'm preparing the messages. That's so rad. So, okay, so a teacher coming into epistle is often very tempted to skip the openings and the greetings and get to the mm. quote unquote heart. And they're tempted to do the same with the farewell. So talk to us a little bit about what you do as a teacher with the greetings. Then that's, that's a really good question because I used to skip them. I used to be like, all right, yada, yada, two from, from Paul to the Colossians. And I, I just want to get to the meat. I want to get to the good stuff. And at the end of it, I would like, all right, there's a bunch of like, greet this person, greet that person. Well, one day I, it struck me that God included this stuff for a reason. And as I slowed down and I thought, okay, how do I teach this? It really struck me that this is a personal letter. It's what this is. Colossians is not an encyclopedia entry on heresies and the, the nature of Christ's deity, right? All those things are in there, but Paul didn't sit down to write that. Paul sat down because there's people he cared about. He had heard about some new believers and he sat down with Epaphras in the room who had started this church after Epaphras told them all about this. And he starts out and he spends time writing who they are and saying, I pray for you guys. So for me, it was actually my, my first time I really had to focus. I, I put myself to the task of teaching the greeting and I put myself in the room with Paul. It was actually the final greetings that really cracked it open for me when he names Epaphras says hello. And Epaphras says, I, I'm praying for you. And uh, Epaphras says, no, I'm wrestling in prayer for you. And when I got in the room and I saw Paul's chains, because his final words in the letter, remember my chains. And suddenly I saw Paul sitting there with chains around his ankles, reciting this letter and I see Paul saying, hey, hand it over. I want, I want to put the final greeting in my handwriting so they know it's me. I want this to be personal. I want them to know it. And I put myself in Paul's shoes and thought of his heart. And then I started praying what Paul prayed. When Paul opens the epistles, he so often says, I thank my God every time I pray for you. And as I pray with joy, right? And I started praying the specific prayers that Paul prayed for the Colossians, for the people I was preaching to. It changed my it changed my whole methodology of teaching because suddenly I wow. cared about the people and uh, I cared for them in the same way that Paul cared for the Colossians. That was now flowing through my heart and and informing my teaching style. Wow, that's that's heavy, man. What about the the final farewells, the 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 goodbyes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those I, I, I used to skip as pointless. I remember one time, one of the most powerful messages ever that ever spoke to me was uh, was I was sitting in a church. It was the end of uh, Thessalonians and the, the teacher was finishing out First Thessalonians. And I remember he said, we're in chapter five. And, and I was just sitting there like, oh, that's the last chapter. It's probably just going to be greetings. And I didn't even think it through. I'm just like, and I, I just like, oh, this is going to be pointless. And, uh, and now I, I open that up and it really was as you go through the personal greetings, they're so beautiful. He says, my fellow prisoner, Aristarchus sends greetings. I saw Paul in chains. I saw Aristarchus next to him listening the whole time that Paul's reciting this and saying, Hey, tell him I said hello. And I saw John Mark and Luke, two of the gospel writers are in the room when Paul is, is reciting this letter and they say, Hey, tell him we love him. Tell him we said hi. And Epaphras. And, and when he when he speaks up, man, I suddenly got Epaphras' heart. He is a church planter. He shared the gospel. He ignited mm. the fire of the gospel in Colossae. And he says, I'm wrestling in prayer for them. And that's so hmm. powerful for, for me, even more for me as the teacher, probably, than it is for my listener. Yeah. You know, every time I preach a gospel, I start off with grace and peace. I'll teach a whole message on that because no matter mm. how messed up the church was, Paul wants them to know God's heart for you is grace and he wants peace with you. Right. So to remind people of that is so powerful. And Paul always says that. 
But then for those of you that don't know me outside of through the word, my last 15 years of my ministry was dedicated to training church planners. So when I come into this part, I get super excited because I study Paul's missionary movements and I see him hold up in Ephesus. He's never spent more than 18 months at any mm. one church plan. On average, over his 12 years of missionary practice, he spent three to four months at every church plan. So this stuff is like it fills in the gaps for a missionary practitioner to see yeah. how they did it in the first century. How did Paul say in Romans 15 that from Jerusalem to Illyricum, I fulfilled the ministry God gave me. Well, he had planted and raised up others. And those others are the ones he's greeting. All these people he trained. Paul could never have done it on his own. But right. you see, hey, send this guy here and I'm sending him to you. And it, it's all these missionary movements. So for me, those passages are missional gold. They are. Actually, you were the first one to, to turn me on to this. I remember when we would be talking about church planning, when I, I started helping with church planning, you were always bringing up these passages that for me at that point, I was still at that place where I was always ignoring the greetings and you were finding gold in there. And you were, it, it's, I sort of like in your brain, you had, had like got the map of Paul's missionary journeys and you were putting pins from every epistle, from all these greetings and little names of these guys, Epaphras and Timothy and, uh, and Tychicus. And they're like going place to place. And, and like, it was clues in there. Like God hid this map yeah. and methodology of church planting and spreading the gospel in these, these bland seeming greetings where I was just like skipping name, 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 don't know him. Can't remember who that is, man, but it's I, powerful. I can, stuff. To I can totally geek out on that. So as, as we, as we kind of move on, I'm going back to when you said, man, you know, I see the mm -hmm. room, like, I love that. And even as you said that, I'm like, wow, I, I often don't see the room like you did. And I think that brings such a life to it. So how mm. do you connect that picture to your audience as you prepare to teach a book like this? Mm. Well, sometimes I like to paint the room for them as Paul is writing. And I, I like to tell that story. Epaphras has just told Paul about this church that he loves. But I also personalize it to my story. And so I connect the people in that room with the people that I've served in ministry with for years. And particularly because both of us have done some church planning, we've both, we've both been on this mission field. And when you are in that, when you get into ministry, there are people in your life, when you say those names, there's a few people you know that you connect with, your, your heart lights up, your mind lights up with memories. And for us, it's guys like Mike Bonomo and Ruben Young and guys like Jason, Cameron, Steve, Eric, and, and the women that, that served alongside of us who, who, who serve so faithfully and love people so well. I think of my wife, Andrea, and your wife, Andrea, who were there in meetings and, uh, and Sarah and Gail and Alma and Julie and Nancy. And when I say those names, actually, when I say those names, I think of them and the way they respond to the names of the people we serve. You get in a room with those guys and you say, hey, has anybody has anybody heard from Jesse? And Mike will light up. Oh, yeah, Jesse's doing good. I just talked to him yesterday. And you hear their heart and the way they talk about them. I picture that room for us, which was a, a church planter training room as we talked about the people we were reaching. And sometimes it was heartbreaking news and sometimes it was heartwarming news about them. But that's the picture. And I put that in my mind as I'm preparing to teach Colossians. I think about them. I pray for them because I want that mm -hmm. heart to come through because that's what Paul was. That's what as Paul was writing, God chose that setting to speak his word. God chose mm -hmm. not to speak his word. He, he didn't pick a guy who said, I need to sit down and write a, uh, an analysis of the heresies of the Gnostics. No, God chose Paul, who was so encouraged by what he heard from in Colossae, but concerned over what he knew was coming in with the heresies that could get him. And he wrote with that heart of concern and love for these brand new believers. I want to teach with that same heart. Yeah, that's awesome. And one little tidbit is that I mentioned Paul moved around, but he plants himself in Ephesus. They plant out the seven churches of Asia, including uh, Colossia, mm. which isn't mentioned in the seven churches of Asia because it's destroyed in an earthquake. So Paul doesn't plant it. Epaphras does. In fact, wow. Epaphras plants a couple of churches 
And um, what, what's amazing, though, and something you can always go back to Colossians and think about is the Holy Spirit knew in his wisdom everyone in this church was going to be dead. Like anyone wow. who hadn't moved on, anyone who stayed there would, would be dead before long because of that earthquake. It would, it would devastate the entire city and kill almost all of the inhabitants. So you think to yourself, like Whitfield used to say, I used to preach as a dying man to dying men, mm -hmm. and, or as a dying man to dying men. And that is the spirit of this book. You can almost go back and look at it like, you know, if I only had a few things to say to people, what would I say? And in the Holy Spirit's wisdom, that's what you have in the letter of the Colossians. They got enough of Jesus, so much of Jesus, but enough to carry them into eternity. Man. So we're, we're, I didn't even time. have that. I didn't even have that when I did. I, now I got to go back. Now I got to go back <laughs> and re-record Colossians. Man, that's, <laughs> that's powerful picture to connect with. All right, guys, we are out of time. So I'm going to close this up. That'll do it for part two in Colossians. Thanks for joining us for teach through the word, the podcast for Bible teachers. All right, tomorrow we're going to jump into the content of Colossians and start digging in to how we teach some of the specifics, some of the key points in Colossians. And uh, later this week, we're going to give you an assignment. But before that, we'll give you some of the uh, the the hacks and uh, how to dig into the book of Colossians. All that's coming up this week. Each week here at Teach Through the Word, we bring you one Bible book or one teaching essential or one guest teacher interview as we equip you, Bible teacher, to do what you do better and together with you to elevate the craft of Bible teaching. Bain Jones, thanks for joining me. Jonathan, we miss you. And we will see you all back here next time.